Nancy Miller is a um, is central uh, to our organization, um, the Idaho Native Plant Society locally in our White Pine chapter, but also um, uh, in the state. So she uh, has many, many different roles. We always turn to, well, what do you think Nancy will think um, when it comes to asking about plants um, or strategies or how things have been done in the past. And um, I'm really excited to hear her presentation because she has, she's such an observant person about um, birds and butterflies and plants and animals, all things that love the forested environment um, in Northern Idaho where um, critters that she loves, creatures that she loves, including Reed, her husband, um, who is a fellow adventurer. Uh, so with that, um, I'm so delighted, Nancy, to have you. Um, I just dearly appreciate you. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Penny. Um, you'll need to probably continue to admit people. I've been doing that, but one of you needs to take it over. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you for the introduction, Penny, and very nice introduction. And thank you for all for the opportunity to discuss native shrubs with you. I'm glad to see many familiar faces. Um, so as Penny said, there'll be an opportunity for you to put things in chat if you have a question. And um, then we can hopefully answer them at the end. I probably overused my time, uh, so I'll try and keep moving through. I'd like to say just a little bit about celebrating Native Plant Appreciation Month. Most of you will remember that we have always celebrated Native Plant Appreciation Week, uh, but this year the INPS State Board had a discussion and decided that they wanted to have Native Plant Appreciation Month, the month of April. It was decided fairly late uh, and we got the request into the governor's office and they actually got the proclamation back very quickly and it's now posted on the homepage of the uh, Idaho Native Plant Society webpage. So we've usually uh, had a week long and we've usually been in conjunction with other states uh, that have Native Plant Appreciation Weeks, but now we have the month. Talk today is going to talk about using native shrubs in your landscape design, and it's um, started out as mainly palouse shrubs, but it's also woodland shrubs, and the shrubs that we're talking about are often um, in many parts of Idaho, not just the Palouse and not just the Moscow Mountain woodlands, et cetera. Uh, a little bit of family background uh, before I start and get into the shrubs. Reed and I both uh, grew up in semi-rural environments and each time we lived in cities and towns, we were anxious to move back to the country. So in 1992, after eight years in Pullman, we built our current home on 10 acres of land that we own east of Viola. Uh, it's a transition zone. We have foothills to the east, we have wheatlands and prairie to the west and the mountain to the south. Because of this transition zone, we had multiple habitats on the property to learn about and to enjoy. And each has a different uh, set of plant species. And early on, I identified uh, over 90 species of plants, not counting the ornamentals I had planted in beds around the, surrounding the house. I need to redo that um, inventory because I know we've lost a few native plants that I used to see one or two of, and I know we've got some plants that I never noticed before. Sometimes it took me a number of years before I saw the plant actually on our 10 acres. So we became more and more interested in the native plant species through our involvement with White Pine Chapter and INPS. And we have many huge ponderosa pine and Douglas fir 
but it was the shrubs that uh, provided an amazing variety for us and a lot of wildlife moving through because of the shrubs. The few shrubs we lacked could be found down the road or up on the mountain. We were already birders, and so birds became the natural impetus to learning more about the various shrubs on our property. We've often heard from other um, speakers in IMPS and the chapter of the importance of using native plants. And it, I think it behooves us to go through that, some of those advantages really quickly. Uh, birds, butterflies, and insects have evolved with native plants and use them for food, nesting, and shelter. Native plants are adapted to our soils and our climate and our insects and wildlife and diseases and grow in communities with other plants with similar needs. Native plants rarely become invasive. They are part of a community which helps keep them in check. If we disturb the means that, whoops, sorry. If we disturb the soil and the means for the, keeping them in check, we uh, start some invasive tendencies. Native plants come in a white variety and diversity of height, shape, leaf texture, and flower color. Gardeners need to pay attention to the native plant needs. They have soil types they will require, sun and shade requirements, moist, dry requirements. They have pollination requirements if they are to thrive. So as gardeners, we need to be aware of all those before we just plug something into the ground. The trees on our property, the ponderosa pine and the Douglas fir and the larch and big cottonwoods are really too big for urban gardens. And so it's natural to look for shrubs to be the backbone of the garden. Shrubs are defined differently by gardeners and horticulturists and professors. And for our purposes, a shrub is, is a small to medium tall woody plant with several perennial stems above ground. It's a very simple de definition, but it works for most of our shrubs. We will discuss a collection of very useful Palouse and woodland shrubs. Most are available locally and quite a few will be available at our May sale, May 13th and 14th. Uh, most are at least moderately well behaved. They may require or tolerate judicious pruning. And a few of them may actually be too big for your urban, an urban garden, but um, it might be worth trying anyway. The selection will include ground covers, shrubs and shrubs that may act like small trees. The I, first one, um, let's see. I'm, Arctic staff on this, Uberus, remember that one? Okay, would, would whoever's talking turn off their um, audio? I Can everyone see it with the, um, I don't know how to remove the control down to the bottom. We can mute everybody, Nancy. Why don't you go ahead? No, I'm. I wanted to get rid of the um, you know how to move the control down to the bottom rather than the top. I've never had it go to the top before. Uh, I do not know. Ava? Oh, whoops. No, I don't think so. What do you want to do, Nancy? Do you want to move forward? Uh, no, I want people to be able to see the writing. I think they can see. I, everybody can see. I can see really well. So you can okay. just... Okay. All right. The Kinnikinnik is hidden for me because it's behind the... Yeah, no, the... it's perfect. It's great. Okay. Really good. Okay. All right, the first one we're, first ground cover we're gonna talk about is Kinnikinnik. It's been described as one of the best um, shrubs, ground covers for erosion control and for covering banks and for wildlife. And uh, let's see, is this, is this is the starting one. 
It's an evergreen ground cover. It spreads um, up to six feet wide if, if it really is happy, and it usually is about only 15 inches tall. It likes sun or shade, moist or dry, and it controls erosion, so it's perfect for banks. If you drive around on Moscow Mountain, you'll see it on the banks on the, on the side of the road in many places. It has clusters of these pink urn-shaped flowers which bloom early and are long-lasting. And they're, it's a marvelous pollination, uh, pollinator plant. It attracts bees, insects, butterflies, and even hummingbirds looking for nectar. After pollination, it produces a red berry, a droop, which is dry and has multiple seeds. And berries ripen in late summer and are retained in winter if not eaten. Berries are eaten by grouse, towhees, evening grosbeaks, sparrows, and other ground feeding birds, as well as small and large mammals. Chipmunks, I think, get quite a few. Uh, some uh, butterflies will have their their larva on kinnikinick and the larva will eat the leaves as part of their food. It is finicky about one thing. It requires an acid soil and prefers pH between 4.5 and 5.5. The second ground cover is one that whereas kinnikinick was a generalist, this one is very specific about its environment, uh, creeping bunchberry. And it is an evergreen ground cover and it's formed by rhizomatous colony of creeping rootstocks. Usually if we're up in the mountains and we see this one blooming, we don't really realize it's a colony. It just looks like a, a number of plants together, but underneath there are creeping rootstocks that connect it all together. It's very effective in partial and full shade. And I only bring it up because I think it might be a, a good plant to try um, in very shady, moist spots in, in our gardens, even at this elevation. It has a white flower, which is actually brax. And the flowers themselves are these little tiny pieces down in the middle of the white flower. Uh, those appear in June to July, depending on the elevation uh, where it's blooming. Flower bracts uh, attract flies and bees for pollination. So it's an, another pollinator plant. If, it's, if, if the flower, little tiny flowers in the center of that uh, larger white one get pollinated, then you'll get that many little red berries produced after flowers are pollinated. They may be eaten by grouse or warbling vireos or sparrows, thrushes, any ground birds that are in the area and some mammals. Each berry has one pit and berries persist into winter. Um, and the leaves will, may turn may turn red. <laughs> yes, in fall. Sorry. This plant has, um, no, I need to, I've lost my place. Okay, the next plant is seen all over the Moscow Mountain area in, along the sides of the road and it's an excellent plant for, for ground cover for urban gardens as well. It also has a spreading colony of stolons, uh, and it has holly-like prickly leaves. It's usually under 15 inches tall, and again, it can grow uh, up to five or six feet in width. Uh, but it's easily managed because you can always separate uh, at the point, one of the points where the root is close to the ground and, and use that plant to go elsewhere where you need it. It does tolerate full sun, but 
uh, the leaves look more stressed, as this, especially as the hot summer progresses. Along Four Mile Road, where we lived last fall, it was so dry and hot that many of the Mahonia turned almost a reddish brown and looked really parched. These yellow flowers are in clusters and they open early and are long lasting. And uh, they attract hummingbirds and other pollinators looking for nectar, such as painted lady butterflies. It is deer resistant because of the prickly holly-like leaves. It produce some, produces blue mahonia berries, and those are eaten by many of the ground, uh, ground feeding birds. Grouse, waxwings, thrushes, juncos, mammals, towies, et cetera. It is an edible uh, berry for humans. It resembles a blueberry in looks, uh, but I can't say that I'm fond of the taste, but I do know others eat it. As I said earlier, the plant is easily kept in check. It provides excellent fall and winter color, and that makes it a good choice as a ground cover for our gardens. The Native Americans had many medicinal uses for uh, Mahonia, and some people do call this Berberus, but I think the common name now is Mahonia. Uh, herbalists and Researcher, university researchers are still finding medicinal uses for this plant. The last ground cover I'll talk about is uh, spreading dogbane. And it's not on the number one list, but we'll discuss it. It's a short plant. It's usually eight to 24 inches tall. In the sun, it's a very loose ground cover, kind of lanky and spreads all over. It uh, unfortunately grows a little too well on hot, dry hillsides. But it is a critical nectar plant for many butterflies, such as the fritillaries. And you may have heard that it's a host for monarchs, but it isn't really. It uh, has very pretty pink flowers, bell-shaped flowers, and they're in terminal clusters on these spreading uh, stems so and it spreads underground via rhizomes and it contains toxins so it's not recommended to handle it unless you have uh, gloves etc now there is one case um, where if you have plenty of space you might consider growing it and we have it on a hillside and then in a couple of small patches on our property and i'm glad we have it um, and the reason is because of the butterflies. These pictures were not taken our, on our property. We were camping in Western Wyoming at one point and in the campground, there was a, a patch of spreading dog rain that was in a fairly shaded, um, moist little spot. And I was actually surprised that it was growing there because I know ours grows on this hot, dry, sunny hillside. Uh, but what amazed me was the number of butterflies. This one patch had about seven, 60 or 70 butterflies on it, and they were all different species. There, were, there was this hair streak, there were multiple fritillaries, there were multiple coppers, and there were multiple crescents. So it, if you have the room and you don't mind some of the disadvantages of it, then it's definitely something you might want to try. But it, it does have toxic elements, so you would need to be careful with dogs and with children that might uh, be handling it or be near it, playing near it. All right. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about the first of the service berries. And yesterday uh, we saw Sarah Walker at the co-op and she said, oh, I'm so glad you're talking about the, the shrubs and the, especially the white creamy shrubs that we have in this area, the creamy flowered shrubs. And I said, yes, there are going to be lots of them in the talk. 
So this is the first one, Servisberry, Amelanchier alnifolia. And it's usually a medium-sized shrub or even a small tree, usually under 15 foot. In sun or shade, it provides a moist, it likes a moist site in spring and you get better berries if it receives water or the ground is moist in the spring, early spring. This particular little short uh, service berry was up on uh, Paradise Ridge and, and it had come up in the uh, shelter of a balsam root at the bottom. And so you can see that even at a very young age, it starts to bloom. You, you don't have to worry about it getting to be a, a big shrub before it blooms and produces berries. It's one of the earliest to bloom. In fact, ours are budding now. Uh, the, it is a good pollinator plant. It attracts bees, insects, spring azure butterfly, and even hummingbirds looking for nectar. But the main thing for service berries, I think, is that many birds eat, use the service berry for eating, resting, preening, and often gleaning insects. Some even, excuse me, some even eat the flower buds. It is deer resistant. This beautiful picture from Gary Queener, um, of the flowers and then some of my pictures from the berries. One of the ways to identify service berry is to look at the leaves. They have rounded edges here at the stem end and then they about midway they start being serrated and slightly pointed and then they're serrated over the other side and then smooth again. They also have these almost parallel arc veins. For humans to eat these, they need to wait just until the right moment. They need to wait until the blueberries are plump and full of moisture. Um, and then you can eat them on your cereal like blueberries or eat them just with yogurt or whatever. They're very good. The When they start out though, they're uh, sometimes a mixture of colors. And so this blue one is the ripe one and is ready to be eaten. These red ones would be quite bitter. Um, and, and yet the robins come in and devour them. They really think the red is the best. If you wait too long for the blue ones and they get a little bit too dry or a little too um, overgrown, then they will be fibrous inside. I've had many people say, oh, I can't eat those berries. They're too fibrous. And that's because they waited too long to pick them. You've got to pick them when they're nice and plump. The birds will eat them all the way until they're totally dried out like raisins. And the um, Native Americans use them in pemmican and other combinations with uh, other ingredients. Here's a picture of a of two, actually two service berries that are under a, a Douglas fir that we've and the trees we've let go full of full size. So that's as big as they're going to get. But most of the service berries on our property are more like shrubs. And if a service berry wants to grow, I let it grow as long as it's not in the way of something else or in the way of some of our activities, because I just treasure all the birds that come to the service berry to get berries during the, the summer and treasure all the berry birds that come and just visit, just stop in the tree to, to preen or to, to rest. Those reddish plums that I pointed out are actually, they're plums, not berries, and they're related to apple. And they turn to purplish blue. And I've already mentioned some of the birds that actually come through getting those berries. In migration time, we'll see many, maybe 20 to 25 species in the service berries, not all at one time, but 
if you watch over a day's period. In North Idaho, where it's much shadier and cooler, these berries can be found in late summer and are food for humans as well as bears and other wildlife. Okay, the next white flowered inflorescent shrub um, is red stem ceanothus. The ceanothus is a wonderful family of wild shrubs in all over the western part of the United States. And all of ours are white. Well, I shouldn't say all, two of them are white in this area, red stem ceanothus and uh, ceanothus volutinus, which is an evergreen. In California, you get the some blue flowered ones and they're quite beautiful and talked about and grown just like a, a lilac might be grown. But all of ours again are white. Again, we've got this large white inflorescence that's made up of lots of little tiny flowers. And those are really an advantage for the pollinators because they can come to one small flower, then move to another flower, then move to another flower, and they expend very little energy, but get a lot of nectar. It's a very fragrant plant, and it's one of my favorites. Um, we only have a couple on our property and I have never seen a seedling come up from it. We have the two that are along our driveway, which used to be the old county road way back in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Um, it's pollinated by the bees and insects. If you go out when it's blooming, you'll see numerous species of insects and bees on the plant, on the flower. It has these beautiful reddish purple stems year round. We occasionally have moose that come through and prune them down a little bit, but they're, they're surviving that. They do, uh, the roots have nitrogen fixing modules, so that's a, a plus. And the flowers may be crushed to make a fragrant soap, but I have never tried this. I've just read about it. Uh, birds and small mammals may eat most all of the seeds. And I think that's why we don't see very many, or we don't see any seedlings underneath. It can be grown from seed, but as with many shrubs, the protocol is quite complicated. And it's almost better to, if you can grow things from cuttings rather than from seed, unless you've got the right setup. The red stem ceanothus does provide cover for birds such as towhees and bluebirds and warbirds. I know that uh, the towhees and juncos often are underneath the red stem ceanothus, so I think they're looking for seeds and also their nest may be close by. Red osier dogwood is as in the past was Cornus stolena, stolenifera, and then it became Cornus sericea subspecies stolenifera. And now uh, my understanding is that it's moving back towards Cornus stolenifera. Um, but I, the herbarium record had not been changed yet, so I, I left it at Cornus sericea. It's a spreading thicket with bright red stems, another one with bright red stems. So you get a lot of winter color and you need to remove suckers to limit the spread. And when I show you a picture of the plant, you'll understand about the suckers. Uh, this shrub is usually 10 feet or less in height, but it can and should be pruned. It likes wet spots. The clusters of white flowers bloom early for a very long period. And the flowers attract insects and insects attract birds. The nectar is used by orange sulfur and other butterflies as well as hummingbirds. It's a relatively easy shrub to propagate and to transplant. And after the flowers have uh, bloomed and been pollinated, then we get these droops, uh, white, whitish berry-like droops, and they disappear quickly. So I think that they get eaten by 
by birds. They're usually birds that move in and out of the red osier dogwood plant. It's also a very good plant for birds to get in because these great big leaves, small birds can move around inside the shrub uh, looking for caterpillars and insects. And uh, you may not even see them or maybe you get a flash of yellow or a flash of uh, yellow and black when one of the warblers is there uh, or you'll see just the leaves move and you know something's in there. Of course, sometimes it's just a chipmunk and chipmunks are okay. <laughs> there are, the leaves are used by butterflies uh, where if their larvae have been deposited on, on the red twig dogwood. This is a picture on the left of a, the red twig dogwood in our yard and it's not fully leafed out, so you don't see those great big leaves. Uh, but you do see the red stems and the obvious need for pruning some of them because they get too many. We prune out the big, bigger uh, stems in the center, usually every couple of three years. And when I talked about layering, you can see that the, this often has stems that lay almost on the ground or close to the ground. So it's easy to, um, to layer these if they, and even pull, take them off if they've got some roots already started. But if you layer them with dirt on top and it, they'll start to uh, sprout roots where there's a, a cut or an opening. When I talked about the birds in the, the the plant. This is an outer branch, so it's not quite as heavy a leaf load as in the center, but you can see this western tanager uh, and it's looking for um, caterpillars or spiders or other insects that would be on the branches, or it may be looking for uh, a young moth or butterfly if it's sitting there. And the next plant, um, next shrub we're talking about is another white flowered or cream flowered one called black or Douglas hawthorn. I prefer Douglas hawthorn, but some do call it black hawthorn. This is the one that is most likely to be a small tree and it will get uh, up to 20 feet tall if it is happy with the amount of sun it gets and the amount of moisture. The Clusters of white flowers, again, attract bees and insects and butterflies and hummingbirds. So it's another pollinator plant and they're looking for nectar. But in the process, the plant flower gets pollinated. The flowers do have an unpleasant odor, uh, but it doesn't last too long. Uh, we have one outside the front door and outside the back door. And it's and then we also have a lot of just loose shrubs here and there on the property. So it is one of the most popular trees on which birds stop and glean insects. And I think I probably take more photos of birds in this hawthorn, partly because it's close to the house, but partly because it's one of their favorite places for resting and preening and getting protection from predators. And the protection comes from um, two different ways. There are lots of, there are lots of uh, small branches that go in all different directions. It's kind of a messy looking plant in some ways, but there are also these big thorns. And it's, I guess we're lucky that our hawthorn only has thorns about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half long because some hawthorns in the United States and Canada have even longer thorns. This particular little humming, rufous hummingbird uh, liked to sit there because the hummingbird feeder was close by and he could sit on a branch and, and watch for competition more than anything else. Uh, 
after it blooms and it produces clusters of dark purple berries with large seeds in August. These are eaten by uh, towns and solitaires, robins, waxwings, again, grosbeaks, and any of the birds that like berries. And it, they're also eaten by chipmunks and squirrels, probably deer if they can reach them, but uh, they would have to reach up into the, the tree. It has some disadvantages. The berries are messy and often they drop to the ground and they germinate underneath. So that would be one reason to put them at the back of the border. It um, also has these thorns and the little branches fall off. And so you don't wanna have it over a lawn because if children are playing and wearing tennis shoes or the uh, person who mows your lawn is walking across the lawn, they have to either pick up the branches or they have to, uh, well, they have to pick up the branches and they have to be on the lookout for thorns. These thorns can actually go through the bottom of a, of a tennis shoe if you sip on one just right. And they can take all the air out of the lawnmower tire if, that, if they run over it. So it, that's another reason to put them at the back of the border. Um, but they are a, one of the best deciduous trees to provide protection from predators like this Cooper's hawk. He's sitting there thinking nobody sees him, but all the little birds know when a hawk is there and they start to put up quite a squabble. And there are butterflies again, who, um, whose larvae grow up and eat these leaves if once they hatch out of the chrysalis. This fellow has his own spines and he's just sitting in the middle of a Douglas Hawthorne, totally not paying any attention to the thorns or the messy branches. Uh, moose will actually eat some of these with the thorns too, so. Okay, the next white flowered shrub is ocean spray or Holodiscus discolor. It's also called cream bush by some people, but uh, I very rarely hear that. I just read it. Uh, and it's also called ironwood, but there are so many different shrubs and trees that are called ironwood in the United States. I don't think that that's probably a, a name we should give it. Ocean spray is a little strange since we're not anywhere close to the ocean, but it does grow close to the ocean. It's a large shrub, uh, but usually less than 12 feet tall. It's best in a hedgerow to help suck uh, support these large flower inflorescences. It does prefer sun and again, moist soil in spring. These creamy white flowers hang in pyramid clusters in July and they're just beautiful. And you'll see them as you drive around in the hills, they will be lighting up the hillside with the white flowers. The clusters will then turn light brown and will persist through winter. But the flowers, again, with this, these many little tiny flowers, each one uh, can be an attractant to insects and hummingbirds and bees who are look, and butterflies looking for nectar. Uh, one book said that this was a host plant for Western brown elfin. Uh, I have not, I haven't been able to really get enough uh, knowledge for myself from butterflies. We have a lot of butterflies during the summer, but I don't always see what, where they've laid their eggs and where they are getting their nectar. I said that it was sometimes called ironwood and it is because the wood is extremely hard. Um, the Native Americans and early settlers used it for many things. It, if it's actually burned or heated in a fire and then rubbed with horsetail stems, it becomes quite uh, even more hard and they can use it for arrows and fish, 
fishing hooks and poles and that uh, can be used for tongs and for spears. And even it can be cut into chunks and used as pegs in construction if it's, there are no nails available. So it's, it's quite a useful plant, particularly for early Native Americans and for pioneers. These dried uh, panicles that are, are inflorescences that dry and, and hang down are a favorite place for winter insect gleaning by chickadees particularly. Juncos can also be found in the lower stems. And it's a very good shrub for insect overwintering. Over and that's why the little birds are looking. The leaves are browsed for food by a number of different butterfly larvae. Another white flowered um, shrub is a medium sized multi stem shrub, at nine, Pacific Nine Bark. It gets up to 12 feet tall and it's best for woodland edges. And it likes moist soils in the spring. It has these clusters of small creamy white flowers that appear in May and June. Most of these. Uh, bloom at different times. They'll start out with the service berry and then it'll just slowly progress. When the service berries are through, another starts blooming and then another starts blooming and another starts blooming. So by having multiple shrubs, you have white flowers, creamy white flowers for uh, an extended period, probably six weeks at least. Bees and other insects are attracted to the flowers for the nectar here, and as are some of the butterfly larva, uh, the butterflies, I should say, the larva eat the leaves. And all three kinds of chickadees will search the branches for insects throughout the year. It's one of the fun places to see chickadees jumping around. After the flower, <coughs> After the flowers are pollinated, excuse me, I need to take a drink. After the flowers are pollinated, uh, there's a cluster of reddish seeds that form and each of the seeds has a yellow pulp and these are eaten by birds and mammals. Um, I rarely see a seedling of this, but I do know that it spreads widely from its underground roots if it's not, if you're not careful. We do have a couple of shrubs in the, uh, close to the house and we keep them from spreading, but under the ponderosa pine up in the woodlands, it, they come up here and there. So it does provide good nesting habit and cover from predators and it provides excellent fall colors, yellows, oranges, reds, um, some beautiful colors. The reason it's called nine bark is because um, the bark exfoliates. And so strips come off of the, the bark as it's uh, in, on the lower stems. Okay, one more. Uh, well, at least one more. This is syringa and uh, or mock orange, and both names are not accurate. They're it's really Philadelphus lewisii. Syringa implies that it's a lilac, and it's not a lilac. But the early pioneers thought it uh, resembled lilac, so they called it syringa. Oh dear. And other names for it are mock orange because when it blooms, it supposedly has an orange fragrance. I'm, I'm usually cognizant of fragrances, but I don't notice this one so much as I do some of the other uh, plants. It does have these great big uh, white flowers with yellow stamens and the Swallowtail butterflies uh, 
really can cover a plant if it's in the right neighborhood. We were up in by Calder one summer and saw very large Philadelphus that were just covered with swallowtails. It does um, provide nectar for the swallowtails and it's necessary to prune out the oldest branches on some of these because they, I think they bloom on the current year's new shoots. And so that's where you get the new flowers for next year. It's another one that doesn't produce berries. It produces capsules that contain seeds and the seeds are very plentiful and usually eaten by any of the ground birds because they fall to the ground and, and are found underneath the, the shrub. It is suitable for nesting and the leaves are used as food for some butterfly, butterfly larvae. Finally, uh, a non-white or cream flowered shrub. This golden uh, current, it has yellow blooms as you can see. And these are shorter shrubs, it's less than six feet tall and they prefer sun to part shade and they will sucker. And if one suckers, then you can cut it off incorporating some of the stem or some of the roots and plant that for uh, another person. That's how I got the, the golden current that's on the deck in a container because one of our members asked me if I'd like a golden current sucker and I said yes and it's now growing on the deck and it's about to bloom now. So the nectar is sought after by bees and hummingbirds and butterflies. And um, Gary Queener was able to get this beautiful picture of a calliope male sitting on one of the branches. It has lots of yellow uh, flowers that are almost tubes uh, and that draws in the insects and the hummingbirds, so, and it forms berries that are then eaten by pheasants, and grouse, jays, robins, thrushes, and people. I've, uh, come, I've put these three roses together because they really share a lot of characteristics. They're all medium-sized shrubs and they all flower in uh, late May or June. And they're all fairly short unless they find a larger tree to climb up. One of them climbs really well and I'm not sure I remember which one. Uh, they like sunny locations. Again, they like some moisture in the spring and they all have pink flowers. Gymnocarpa is the bald hip rose and it has smaller flowers and they have sort of a creamy center, at least the ones on our property do. Nutkana and Woodsy I both have bigger flowers. This one I believe is a Nutkana and they, um, the Woodsy I is more likely to have small clusters and the Nutkana is more likely to have singleton flowers. All three are good for hedgerows and informal wilder gardens, and they will sucker. Uh, they're an important cover plant for birds and small mammals because they can get in and be protected from uh, predators. They produce nectar for insects, for butterflies, for, and they attract birds and predator insects as well. All provide excellent fall cover. They all have different shaped um, hips. There are pear shaped ones, round shaped ones. The round ones are from Nutkana. Uh, and Gymnocarpa is oval like this and is bald hip. So it has no sepals at the end of the uh, hip. 
the hips are eaten by many birds as well as mammals such as deer and chipmunks. I think the chipmunks get most of ours. But if they leave me some rose hips that are, that are red, then at Christmas time I can incorporate them into Christmas ornaments and into um, wreaths, etc. In the fall, there's beautiful uh, red leaves, and the leaves are eaten by butterfly larvae, and they're also eaten by leaf cutter bees that use them for nesting material. That would be more in the summer when they're green. Blue elderberry is another um, is another large plant. Um, it's a medium sized shrub, but it's fairly rangy. It has long stems and big leaves, and it has the white, creamy inflorescence that again the birds and butterflies and and insects just need to come for. Um, one trip and hit lots of little flowers. Okay. It does have vigorous rapid growth, so it can be very large if, if it's happy and it tolerates being pruned. It's easily started from cuttings, um, and it, but it mostly starts from birds dropping the elderberry berry, and they take root where they come up. So uh, it, we've had two on our property and in both cases, they were in inappropriate spots. They were growing in the middle of something else or growing in the middle of a culvert area. And so we've, I've taken them out, but I'm bound and determined to have an elderberry. So we will plant, plant some soon, maybe after the sale this year, because we will have some in the sale. It, it is because of its ranginess, it's best as a woodland or back of the border specimen. And it's a little messy with those seeds that are berries that drop. It uh, has these bluish gray berries. And if you're driving around in the late summer, watch for them because you may be able to harvest some if they're not on private property and, and make elderberry jelly. Uh, it's a different species than the elderberry that uh, is used in the syrups and stuff for providing immune therapy, but uh, I think it still does some good. It's just not the one that they use for med medicines. And those are European or Israeli. Uh, elderberries generally. The fruit is eaten by many birds and one of the delights on the St. Joe River in, in the late summer is to see the cedar waxwings devouring these elderberries uh, with their young because they time the uh, breeding of their the laying of their eggs and the breeding of their ba baby uh, wax wings so that the young will come out just as all the berries are available for them to eat because that's their favorite food. And as I said, the plants are spread by birds depositing berries in suitable or unsuitable habitats, but if it's suitable, they'll grow. We have two mountain ashes in northern Idaho. Um, the Idaho mountain ash is more typical here in the foothills, and the Sitka mountain ash is more typical of northern Idaho, where it's cooler and uh, more moist. So what, where we generally see Idaho mountain ash, uh, Scopulina, is on the road to the uh, giant uh, Ponderos or giant white pine campground. And you'll see a flash of white berries, uh, red berries, or a flash of white flowers, depending on the time of the uh, summer. The early bloom is very fragrant. 
again, this flat flowered cluster, but it attracts insects and butterflies and bees looking for nectar. And in the process, the flower gets pollinated. It is slow growing and it's fairly lanky. Uh, it, it kind of needs some support, totally different than the European ashes, which are growing in Moscow and Pullman yards, uh, which are quite sturdy trees. The berries can be bright red or bright orange, and they're eaten by all the birds that, that like berries. So, and they provide good fall color. The, I'm not sure of exactly of the criteria for the, telling the difference between the two mountain ashes. So I'm not sure if this one is a Sitka or an Idaho. I'd have to look up where I took the picture, but I think it was one of the more Northern counties. But they, the two mountain ash, as I understand it, have a different number of leaves on these stems that can come out from the main stems. Beautiful plants though when they're blooming and beautiful plants when they're full of berries. Uh, this one, birch leaf spirea, is also called birch leaved spirea. And I think uh, Penny said its name is changing from spirea, spirea betulifolia, uh, which is too bad because betulifolia told you that it was a birch life like leaf. Uh, it's a very nice ornamental shrub. Uh, it can be mixed with other shrubs or added to a perennial border because it's less than three feet tall. And it does tolerate being lightly shaded. Uh, the ones we have are actually at the base of some wild roses. So one of the, probably new canna. It is rhizominous, but it's not aggressive. And you can propagate more plants from these new stems. It's a great plant for, um, for rock gardens or for perennial beds because it doesn't get more than three feet tall. And it is deer resistant, and it's a great pollinator plant. And all the butterflies and bees and other insects looking for nectar look for these little tiny tree uh, flowers, and each one has some nectar. It also attracts other beneficial insect pollinators, such as surfid flies, which eat aphids. I'm told this, I don't know this for. I have not observed this myself. But. Snowberry uh, is another shrub that's not too tall. It gets a kind of a bad rap because people think it's uh, too bushy and too much of a thicket, um, but it can be controlled. And it has these really teeny little flowers. Um, they're probably, maybe an eighth of an inch. I should measure them this summer and see exactly how, how uh, big they are. But I had my iPhone set on max power and got really close in order to take the, this picture. Uh, the white berries, these bloom for a, a, an amazing amount of time. And the white berries are eaten by uh, birds and small mammals, uh, grouse like them, quail like them, and the berries will persist in the fall if they're in winter if they're not eaten. Uh, oftentimes along Four Mile Road where we live, there are lots and lots of white berries in the late fall. On our property, they seem to get eaten by the birds fairly quickly. The, and the birds use the thicket forming snowberry for nesting, for cover, for shelter, for gleaning, and for other activities. These pictures were actually taken with my phone on the same day in September. So you can see how long they produce little, these little flowers that are nectar sources. And we always uh, often have uh, Anna's hummingbirds here in September until the first part of October, because they come over from the west side. They're not migrating, they're just on a walkabout. They're looking around to see what's available to eat and 
what other butter, what other hummingbirds are around. So by then, all in September, all the other hummingbirds have left, but the Anna's is here. And they use these snowberries. So I'm glad to have the snowberries. And I hope that more people in, in use them and incorporate them into their gardens. They are kind of a flimsy branch. And so it's really nice that they can um, arch over when there's snow cover. And they, the arches provide a nice little hole for quail and towies. And uh, we recently had quite a snowstorm and the towies were already here and the juncos were already here and they all were underneath some of these arches that the, um, because the snowberry provided such a nice cover arch. Uh, we're getting close to the end. Um, and I want, but I wanted to talk about the willows. We will have um, Schooler's Salix and Drummond's Salix at our sale. They are two of the willows that are called upland willows, meaning that they will grow in uh, meadows or drier areas. They don't have to have uh, riparian areas like so many willows have to have actually their feet in water or next to water. So these are along our driveway and um, have a meadow on the other side. And each willow has its own, sports its own distinctive pussy willow. So if you are out looking at willows right now is the time to check out what their pussy willow looks like. And some of them are quite complex and some of them are just fuzzy little balls, but uh, they usually at this time of year have insects uh, floating around. Before the last snowstorm, I saw actually some, uh, some butterflies uh, that were visiting, but I haven't seen a butterfly since we had the the snowstorms, late snowstorms. Uh, these, the willows on our place are mostly just across the driveway in a sort of a hedgerow. And the, the, we're able to see the birds that come through them uh, just from the bedroom. And there's often a hummingbird who's using the branches as a favorite perch because they like the, the branches that have died and are still sticking up. And they're looking for flying insects and they're looking for competing male hummingbirds. Um, now is the time to be watching willows for the warblers that will begin to move through. The first few have been, uh, we've had a Nashville, and I think today I saw a yellow and I've seen other people report Nashville's as well. Uh, Nashville, yellow warbler, orange crown warbler, yellow rump warbler, McGillivray's warblers. We don't have as many warblers as in the east, but we do have some really nice ones that pass through in generally in May and some of them stay around to breed on our property and, and close by. Um, in the winter, there's birds like Stellar Jay and Dark-Eyed Juncos, they often play in the bare willow branches. They chase each other and it's, it's quite fun to watch them. Uh, catbirds usually have their nest in the, in the willows or underneath and sometimes towies also have a nest in the, in the willows. Here's an example of one of the um, butterflies that comes to the willows. This one is a tortoise shell brush foot, but I, I don't think it's a Milbert's. I think it's a different one, but I don't know my, I'm just learning my butterflies. So they come and, and uh, come to the, the pussy willows and then they later uh, come to the leaves. Two additional uh, shrubs that we can consider, especially for wildlife. Um, they're really good for a property out here because they 
They can form a small thicket out here. Bitter cherry is at the bottom of our uh, pasture in a small thicket, and the birds really like it. Uh, birds like this western tanager will stick around in the fall and, and eat every red berry that uh, is produced before they leave. And they always, their young ones are getting fat and ready to migrate south. Choke cherries uh, also are out here along Four Mile Road. We do not have one on our property, but there's several that are only about a half mile away on the side of the road. So when you're driving mountain roads, look for these beautiful inflorescence, the bitter cherry or the choke cherry. Um, and some years we have these in our May sale, but I don't think this year we're going to have them. And these are some shrubs that are more typical of the Moscow Mountain and the shadier areas, but I did want to just point them out. We will only have thimbleberry this year uh, as a shrub and most years we have Spirea de Glacia, which is the pink one, but our grower did not grow them this year. So native garden design, some of this is stuff everybody knows already, um, so I won't spend much time on it, but maximize those areas which transition from densely planted to open areas. Think meadow next to a forested area and put the trees at the back as well as any shrubs which are tall, messy, or drop berries or have thorns. That saves the smaller shrubs and perennials for the front of the borders. Plant densely so that birds can move around between plants safely and use the hedgerow concept between city lots or to separate larger properties into rooms. Uh, I think I'll skip most of this. It's basically about supplying water and food and picking your shrubs uh, for the berries and nuts and seeds that you know the birds that you want to attract uh, like. And it's important to reduce your pesticide use. The insects are beneficial and the birds and the bats need the insects to survive. And they provide the insect control if you'll let them. But native plants should need very few pesticides. Another uh, thing you probably might not think of is if you have some ornamentals and exotic plants in your garden or even invasives in your garden. If the seed birds might eat those seeds and then take them elsewhere and deposit them, you want to deadhead those before they actually go to seed. Oops, I need, do need to give the references and the thanks. Um, my Bible from the very beginning when we moved out here was Gardening with Native Plants of the Pacific Northwest by Art Kruckeberg. Um, this is out of print and can be sometimes found in at Brews Books in Pullman or another used bookstore. It's been updated uh, significantly by a woman whose last name is uh, Chalker Scott. And it's still a very good book, but I'm partial to the old black and white version. Uh, Landscaping for Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest by Russell Link is a excellent book for beginners to find out all about plants, animals, butterflies, insects, habitats. It's just a a complete book of, of, about nature in the Pacific Northwest. Landscaping with Native Plants of the Inner Mountain Region uh, was put out by the BLM in conjunction with BSU. And it has it's three PDFs that you can download from the uh, internet. And one is trees, and one is shrubs, and one is uh, forbs forbs and grasses, I think. So it covers shrubs of the whole central part of Idaho and this part of Idaho. 
uh, Landscaping with Native Plants of the Idaho Panhandle uh, was put out by the Kinnikinick Native Plant Society. Don't get turned off by the Idaho Panhandle term because it's really an excellent book for anyone who's beginning their journey with native plants in this part of Idaho. And again, thanks to Jerry, Gary Queener and Terry Gray for allowing me to use some of their photographs. They gave me permission years ago and I've just kept using them. So the rest were my own. So I will stop sharing right now and we can look at the few things in chat. Wow. My husband Thank kept you. making faces at me, so I know I wasn't uh, actually looking animated enough, but I uh, couldn't see myself. My picture disappeared. So <laughs> I just kept going. So hopefully I was not too quiet and not too, I don't know. <laughs> Nancy, so. that was wonderful. It was Thank so, you. um, your photographs are stunning and I learned so much about birds and butterflies. So, and um, while we're doing thanks, I'm gonna thank Ava uh, Strand who's been running the Zoom in the background and she's gonna um, pull questions out of chat for you. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. This was, that was really good. I learned a lot, of, lot about the shrubs and the birds. And um, there are a few questions here in the chat. So one of them is, uh, do these shrubs grow well together? Uh, they will certainly benefit uh, so many birds, butterflies, bees, and creatures. Do having a mix of shrubs attract different creatures? So, so is it uh, beneficial to mix the shrubs? Yes, very much so. Uh, the, the old hedgerow concept from European days is, is still valid today and the fact that you have multiple shrubs together means that different birds and different insects can be servicing different shrubs at, at the same time, or you can have different flowers, flowers in one and then later flowers in the other. And it gives, having them close together gives birds um, and small mammals a way to, to move from one shrub to another. Uh, and not go out into the open. If you have a shrub over here and another one five or six feet away, they have to pass between uh, in an open area and they're uh, likely to uh, be found by a cooper's hawk or, or a, uh, one of the other sharp shinned hawks, one of the other small hawks that like to find birds or even some small man mammals will attract attack birds. Yeah. Uh, so another question is, which ones would you consider the most fragrant? I think some folks might be interested in fragrant uh, flowers. Yeah. Um, they, they all have a, a degree of fragrance, it seems like. Um, the mock orange obviously has the, the orange fragrance. Um, well, I don't know. I, I just talked about which ones were fragrant and now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But um, well, the only, I think only the Black um, or Douglas Hawthorne is, is not very nice smelling. It, it smells, well, I won't even describe how it smells. Is, but is it, it, it a flower that smells not so well? Or, or? The flower actually smells not good. Uh, it's kind of like a like if you know you, you walked in some dog manure it has a little okay. bit of that, oh, that kind of smell, <laughs> but it's uh, it, it it doesn't last long. And but most of the others do have some uh, fragrance. The service berry has fragrance. Mock orange, uh, syringa has has fragrance. Um, the Philadelphus. Well, I already said that one, so. Yeah, the roses definitely are fragrant. Thanks, Reed. And another question is, um, 
You mentioned having running water. Is there a recommendation? A recommendation on having water features nearby or how do you relate the shrubs to water if you have an opportunity to make that change? Well I, I think the shrubs themselves do not uh, they need the water in the soil uh, at times they need uh, the rain in the springtime if they don't get rain in the springtime then you may need to water them. Uh, the birds are what requires and prefers the running water. Uh, we keep a small bird bath. And even the other day when there was snow on the ground from that last snowstorm, the chickadees were taking a bath in the bird bath. But my husband has also built a water feature. And during the summer, he puts that together. It's just a tub with a, a fountain that goes up and and spouts out water. And that has brought a lot more birds in, particularly in the late summer when it's very dry and hot. So yeah. a, a lot of birds come for that. So to maybe having the water, the, the water um, source at, near the shrubs could be a, a good thing to do to attract more birds. Yes. Um, I like the, when Betty and Ray lived in town on 7th Street, they had a lovely pond uh, and there was moving water and it was right underneath the shrubs and under some large trees and they got a lot of birds that came to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so running water particularly is always attractive to birds. They like to take baths, they like to get drinks. Uh -huh. And it's true of birds from some of the tiniest ones to, um, up to the quail and grouse. So. Yeah, and we have more questions here. Uh, you did talk about that there were so many green flowered plants. So yes. why, why are so many of the flowers white or green flowered? I have no idea. <laughs> that is a good they just are. And it, it isn't true necessarily in other habitats. I, I don't I mean, it was true of many of these same shrubs that grew in California when I was growing up, but there were blue and more yellow and more pink ones, I think. And I, I don't know, for some reason, we just need to celebrate the white flowers of Idaho as the shrubs progress through the, the seasons, as they really are some incredible blooms. Be sure and get out and look at the hillsides and try and identify the ones that you're seeing uh, at, at a different different time period. So, yeah, we have getting back to the water here. We have another questions about if you do install a water feature or a fountain, should you be putting it in the shade or in the sun? Um, I would I would assume partial shade would be beneficial. Yeah, uh, especially if the water is stagnant, you know, if it's 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 not moving and it just sits there if it's hot and in the sun, then that's probably could grow some things you didn't want to grow. If you do have water in a bird bath, you need to clean the bird bath and you need to to refresh the water frequently mm. because in the in the hotter weather it will. Uh, get stagnant quickly. And yeah. shrubs, berries will fall down into it or leaves will fall into it and, and uh, birds will sit on the edge and do what they do and then uh, you've got contamination to the water. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, yeah, we have another question here. I'm having trouble getting my syringa and ocean spray to grow. Uh, could I be overwatering? Oh, gee, that would be hard to tell without knowing what the soil conditions were. And and uh, they do like a a lighter soil probably than some of the heavy soils. But I I really don't. I'm not a soil expert other than I know what is on our property, but. Uh, and so many urban gardens, they've brought in soil and it's questionable. And so it's really 
difficult to, to tell what might be wrong. I suspect that a county extension agent or one of the local botanists could probably look at it. Native plants in general should not need much water, but native shrubs, yeah. but they will need shrub water to get started when they're young. So lots of this, uh, again, lots of clay, uh, the, uh, Mar uh, Mara here that has the, the question said that it's a lot of clay in her soil. That um, could be the culprit then. Yeah, I I did I bought a syringa from the Native Plant Society just last year, and it's doing pretty well. And I did I have not been watering it very much, so maybe yeah. try maybe at least try that. Um, maybe that's maybe that's the issue. Well, clay has a a way of um, taking in water and becoming like adobe. If, uh, if it hasn't been amended with some better soils and, or even some um, gravelly soils. So. Yeah, I'll get, that could be another thing to try to, to get another plant and put it in a, a different soil type or a lighter. Yeah. And it's important with any shrub to really dig a, a fairly big hole, even if your plant is fairly small. Uh, to dig a fairly big hole, but you don't want to have a base. When we first moved out here, part of our property was a quarry and part of the land had been just totally scraped off by trucks and, you know, that had been coming to get rocks and by trucks bringing people who were gonna work at the quarry. And we didn't really realize it. And we, we literally had to get, um, a uh, really big tool to dig some holes. And they turned out to be like vases. You put water in them and they just kept water. And that was it. It wasn't a good place to plant a plant, obviously. But yes. they had, the soil had been packed down and the soil, because it was part of the quarry, was not good soil. But in other places, we have some very good soil. It's mountain soil, but it's very good soil. Yeah, I think some some folks are uh, needing to leave. So maybe Nancy, if you could put your email in the chat so that people can contact you if they have more questions. And then if if uh, we'll probably end here pre pretty quickly. But if you have a couple, we can probably take a couple more questions. Uh, but if you need to leave, of course, you can do so. But uh, I think we can take a couple more questions from Nancy. And there is the email. So if you look at the chat, you can see nmiller at moscow.com if you have additional questions for Nancy. And I also do get all of the whitepine.chapter at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, if someone wants to um, send an email to that address, if they can't remember the N Miller. At Moscow. Yeah, that's, that's how you can join the chapter too, right? Emailing the White Pine chapter. Right. Yep. So that's another yeah, so good reason to thanks, email. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about some of these really special shrubs that we've got. Indeed. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, we really enjoyed it very, very much. And it's a good uh, lead in to our native plant sale, both to the yard tours on May 7th and then the native plant sale. Uh, you mentioned that quite a few plants that you included here will be in our sale and available uh, for people. And you'll have a couple of days to browse um, the plants and it has a lot of information like Nancy already gave um, about all the different plants we have and then um, purchase them um, online and then come and pick them up and see what other ones we have. Yeah, and uh, Jana just um, asked a question about where the sale was and when, and I think she came in a little bit late. So uh, Jana, if you will very soon have all the information on our whitepineinps.org website, it's the 13th and 14th, and it's an online sale and then pickup will be in Mos Moscow at uh, the PCEI greenhouse. So. 
Did we get all the questions? Thanks, yeah, everybody. We did. I think we got all the questions. Good. And thank you for recording, Ava. Yes, I'm going to stop recording now. So if there's additional chat, you can keep chatting, but the recording will stop. Right, and it will be on uh, YouTube in a minute.